Thank you very much. By way of introduction, let's look at something that every credible scientist recognizes. Increases in greenhouse gases promote warming. And the idea here is relatively simple. We have a hot sun. It's radiating at short wavelengths because of its heat. That energy comes to the Earth, largely passes through our atmosphere, is absorbed by the surface. Our planet's quite a bit cooler than the sun. It radiates to space, that energy. It's radiating at a longer wavelength. Those longer wavelengths are selectively absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. And those are gases like carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane. Now, if we took away the selective absorbers in our atmosphere, the Earth would be a not so balmy five degrees Fahrenheit. And with selective absorbers, the Earth is 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is really even a definition of a greenhouse gas, more appropriately called a selective absorber. Now, what are the issues about those selective absorbers that we need to think about? Well, many, many people have been sitting there looking at this topic and talking about, is global warming real? Do you have warming with increased greenhouse gases? In fact, we know, and you can just take the argument that, that I just presented, that if I add selective absorbers into the atmosphere, I don't have a lot of choice. I change that energy balance. And so any addition of selective absorbers will promote warming. The issue is, how much will it warm? Particularly, how much will it warm in response to human activities? The second question that I put up there that's a real issue of the debate is, how fast is this going to happen? Your lifetime, longer, a portion of your lifetime. And the third question is, how significant will be the impact of that warming? Now, my view is, after working on large-scale climate models for a good portion of my life, is that those first two questions, how much, how fast, are going to be uncertain for quite a long time. This is just a complicated problem. The atmosphere, the ocean, the land surface, they are not simple. And we're up against really tough problems now in trying to make simulations and predict things for the future. So probably if you ask me to come back, say, oh, that was a pretty good talk. Maybe he'll come back in a decade and he'll tell us what's going on. Those same two questions will be sitting up there. How much will it warm? How fast will it warm? That means that if you're a decision maker, the third question comes into play in a very different way. How significant are those impacts going to be? And here I have to tell you, we're starting to leave science behind. Because an awful lot of that last issue depends on what you value and where you think you're vulnerable and how you assess risks. And people do it differently and it becomes a very complicated question, a social question as well as a science question. Let me illustrate that. And this is a debate discussion that I had with an economist. And he said, I've modified it slightly, suppose I got a contract to cut down all the trees on the west side of Austin. Good thing or bad thing? This I love an audience that participates. Thank you so much. So everybody I heard said bad. And my economist friend said, no, Eric, this is good. This is a product. You sell it. It brings in money. Money pays for jobs. That brings in other parts of, of, of industry and commerce. And they generate dollars. This is a good thing because it drives economic growth. And perhaps like you, I said, no, wait a minute. What about beauty? What about ecosystem services like water? What about our, our notion of habitats here? Don't you add that into the equation? And he said, no. In one generation that's never seen the west side of Austin covered with trees, they won't know what they've missed, and it will still look beautiful. 
The proof of this is England. All of you may know someone who's gone to England and come back. Maybe you've gone to England and come back. But nobody comes from England and goes, Oh, ugly country. It's been deforested. It's horrible. And that's because the deforestation took place hundreds of years ago. And nobody has a picture of England in its natural forested state. And yet they see the rolling hills and they see the bales of hay, and they see the sheep on the landscape, and they look at it as being beautiful. And so the economist is telling us here that unless you sign, assign value there, the economist can't. Because obviously people come back from England and think it's beautiful. An interesting challenge. An illustration of why this isn't just a science issue, this is a social issue. Okay, so now how am I going to wrap that bit of introduction into a talk? What I'd like to do is say, what do scientists really believe about global warming? What are the predictions for the future? What are the potential impacts? Those three components go through each one by one. What do climate experts say about global warming? And I actually had this experience, I had it twice, once in the Clinton administration and once in the Bush administration. And basically, uh, the idea was to get every climate scientist from different perspectives in the same room at the same time talking to each other and having us come out the door with exactly what it was about climate and climate predictions that we could all agree upon. And where were those things that we would not agree upon? And the first time that I did this, I was actually the chair for this uh, particular event. And just to tell you how tense this issue is, I sat down as the chair. I did this at the invitation of the White House. The climate skeptics are in the room. The people who believe the sky is falling in the room were all in there together when a noted professor from an Ivy League school turned to the head of the Princeton Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory and he said, you know, if you had the faintest understanding of physics, you wouldn't say that. And I just about died right then and there, okay, <laughs> especially as chair. And the head of the Princeton Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory turned to the Ivy League professor, I won't mention his institution, and said, I assure you, I have a fine knowledge of physics, and I have a sense of ethics as well. So this tells you here that this is not exactly one of those topics for which scientists don't get just as emotional as anybody else. But on the other hand, we sat down, even though I was about to go out the door and say, I don't care if the White House asked me to do this, I, I, don't, I don't think I can sit through here this group settled down and they wrote down what it is that they could all agree upon. They had this as a foundation. Carbon dioxide is a selective absorber. Selectively absorbs that outgoing long wave radiation. Greenhouse gases are increasing and they're increasing because of consumption of fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and also because of deforestation. If you put more greenhouse gases, more selective absorbers, into the atmosphere, you're going to promote warming. You just can't put a selective absorber in there without changing the way the energy balances. Nobody can figure out a way to have the problem disappear in a short amount of time. The drawdown by the system is probably going to take decades, centuries. Aerosols, small particles, also have human sources. Many of those aerosols actually promote cooling and they're human sources. The planet has warmed a degree Fahrenheit over the last century. So all of these things are things that this scientific group, no matter what part of the spectrum they were on, could sign up to, okay? We're putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They're selectively absorbing. That will promote warming. I didn't say how much. I didn't say how fast, right? Okay, now, this is what they view as part of that in terms of what 
some people would call the smoking gun. And that is they measure temperature and it has this record that looks like this. Now we have to be very cautious here because there's substantial error bars here and there's a body of people who believe that there was a medieval warm time period where the temperatures in some areas could have been this warm. Big part of the debate is the shape of this curve, but this is sort of the sum. The CO2 concentrations that we measure in the atmosphere and in ice cores, the carbon emissions from land use change, deforestation, and fossil fuels. And it is this pattern here that people describe as the smoking gun of why we have to think about what humans might be doing. And if you want a little bit closer picture, and we go 1880 to 2000, this is the temperature record that we see um, for, uh, for the uh, globe uh, through time. And, and it's very important to see this because there's substantial natural variability to this curve. And if you're curious how this projects on a map, you can see it here, 2001, 2005, mean surface temperature. This is a comparison with what the average is. And the things that I would like to point out here to you is that where is the warming occurring? It's occurring at high latitudes. The second most significant area of warming is continental interiors, and it's the oceans that are experiencing the least warming. So we have this pattern. It has substantial natural variability to it, and geographically it has an expression where the greatest sensitivity appears to be at high latitudes. Okay, so now with this, as the foundation, this is what we observe of how the system is changing. Didn't really tell you anything else in terms of rate, magnitude, where it's going, how much of it is human, any of those elements. This group sat down to say, what can we tell people about climate model predictions and how certain can we be? And they decided to give odds with words like, this is a very probable outcome, this is a probable outcome, so just for the sake of argument, what does it mean to you if I say something is very probable in terms of a percent likelihood? 70, 80, what? 90, okay. Now what you realize is by saying those words, the scientists took on a little wiggle room for themselves, right? Because we can't say these things with precision, all right? And so what's virtually certain? Well, what's virtually certain is that the stratosphere will cool. It's in every observation, it's in every model, and there's a good physical reason for it. So virtually certain, everybody in the room could agree to it. But I tell people there's one problem, and that is nobody lives there. It's not one of those things that you're really paying attention to what's happening with the stratospheric temperatures. That's the only thing we put on the list that's virtually certain. The next thing we put on the list are all the things that are very probable. And I heard the percentages that were out there that people are talking about. And of course, 50-50, a coin flip. That's uncertain, right? So this is very probable. Okay, now let's look at this. Surface temperature will increase a half a degree by 2 degrees C by 2050. 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C for a CO2 doubling that will occur sometimes toward the end of the century. 2.5 degrees C most likely. What's going on here? We all read in the newspaper about what's not happening, happening. He said, she said, all of this all over the place. How is it that these two people that started the meeting by calling each other names could agree to this? And the reason is simple. If you are highly skeptical about climate change, this number, one, one and a half degrees C for doubling, in additional warming that we experience, they believe that that's a logical outcome. So they're not saying warming won't occur. They're saying it's on this order of magnitude and I don't think that's very important. The people that tell you, look out, the sky is falling, the earth is changing dramatically, this is the number they're worried about or some of them a little bit higher. But as long as you provide it in a range 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C for a CO2 doubling, everybody in that room could sign on as this being a very probable outcome 
So no one in the climate community is expecting no additional warming. It's the magnitude that defines the difference between people who say, I don't think we need to worry about this, and the people who say, we really need to worry about this a lot. Okay, next thing on the list, global precipitation will increase. Why is that on the list? As soon as you accept some notion of warming, you accept the notion of increased evaporation and therefore increased moisture in the atmosphere and greater rainfall somewhere. It doesn't say where, it doesn't say how much, it just says a warmer planet is likely to have a more, a more active hydrologic cycle. Sea ice will retreat in the northern hemisphere and the Arctic will warm. Why is that on the list? That one is on the list because this is the area of the Earth that has the most potent feedbacks associated with any climate change. And here's basically the idea. An ice surface is white. It's highly reflective. If something occurs that makes the planet begin to warm and I retreat a little bit of that snow and ice, I replace that highly reflective surface by a darker, more absorbing surface. So I absorb a little bit more solar energy. I make it a little bit warmer. That melts a little bit more snow and ice. That removes that white reflective surface that allows me to absorb more energy and promote warming and you see this feedback occur. So what we see throughout Earth history, the action occurs at high latitudes. And the map I showed you, the action was occurring at high latitudes. So throughout Earth history and in every single model simulation, once you say it's going to warm and you accept even a modest amount of warming, you accept the notion that you're very probable that you will have sea ice retreat in the northern hemisphere. Okay, very probable. Sea level rise. Now here is again something that you're constantly reading about in the press as being controversial. What's really controversial is whether something dramatic can happen. But some level of sea rise, sea level rise, we should accept because if I melt permanent snow and ice on the continent, that's going to add water to the ocean. And if I believe that there's warming, seawater sea expands when we heat it. So once you accept the notion of some warming, you accept the notion of some seawater expansion, and you accept the notion of continental melting of ice and snow. The hard part is what Antarctica is going to do and what Greenland's going to do. So the number could be different, but those two effects are going to create some tendency towards sea level rise. There's another interesting one up here, and that is the sun doesn't count very much. Every single person in the room looked at it at most, with all physical known mechanisms, at most as being maybe 20% of this issue. Okay. Now, what's uncertain? And I'll skip the probable ones, and I'll go to what's uncertain. Oh. Climate variability. Regional climate changes. What's going to happen to tropical storms? What's going to happen in the biosphere? This is a very different type of issue. These are issues that I have to know everything about. If I'm going to understand what's exactly going to happen in Austin, then I need the whole details of how everything around Austin changes in the context of the globe. If I'm going to get natural variability right, I better understand how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, interacts with the land surface and snow cover, where are there are places the climate system has memory because it's rain in a particular area and that allows me to evaporate that moisture for a period of time. Every single detail I have to be able to capture to tell you what the variability is going to be like in the future, whether or not the storm tracks are going to come right over your neighborhood or they're going to be shifted slightly north of it. And things like tropical storms, not even simulated, except in the very highest resolution, most comprehensive models that are taking the world's fastest computers, are we beginning to simulate the detail of a hurricane? Can you imagine being able to understand the eye wall of a hurricane? A hundred years from now, in a model simulation, in which the grid spacing in the model is many, many miles. How do I do the eye wall? 
all of a sudden you realize how complex this problem is, that you have to know every detail to be able to do that. And I can think of scenarios that make the storm stronger. I can think of scenarios that make them weaker. If we have El Nino, for example, in an El Nino time, we have so much shear in the atmosphere that we don't develop storms within the tropical Atlantic very well. So is El Nino going to lock in the future? Is it going to be more extreme in the future? The detail that I have to know becomes so much more difficult. Now, so you see all the climate scientists in the room, the skeptics and those people that are really worried about what's going to happen. If it's global and it's a range, they can all agree. They see themselves within that range. If it's a specific time, a specific place, and the detailed characteristics of things like storms, we can't agree. It's too uncertain. It's too difficult to make that prediction. Okay, now this is sort of interesting, right? Because I'm willing to bet that none of you turn on the radio in the morning to hear what the globally average surface temperature is that day. <laughs> It's not what you're interested in. This is what you're interested in. This is what decision makers use when they, when they think about something. What's going to happen to where I am and what's going to happen tomorrow or five years or ten years? And so the things that you most want to know that impact you, I can't tell you. And those things that are less interesting to you but tell us the planet's changing, I can give you in a range. Okay, so what to do here when you realize that difficulty that the climate modelers have to give you this kind of information. Well, one thing we can do is look at how climate change is predicted for where you live, right? So we're going to do this for 2090 to 2100. And there's a big range in model predictions. There are the model predictions that are close to one and a half degree global warming and there are model predictions that are close to four and a half degree global warming. So we're going to pick two, one at the low end of the spectrum, about two degrees, and one at the upper end of the spectrum, about four degrees, in terms of their sensitivity for doubling of CO2. So even though I can't tell you here's the world 100 years from now, I can tell you here's the range of prediction that are coming out of climate models today. Okay? Does that make sense? The two models that are selected for this purpose are the model produced by the Canadian government, and so, again, this is how much warmer the Canadian model is predicted to be in summer and how much warmer the Canadian model is predicted to be in winter compared to the present day, all right? So it's a delta. It's a change in temperatures. This is a model on the lower end of the sensitivity. It's a model developed at the Hadley Center in the United Kingdom. Summer, winter. Okay, there's two things to see here because you can be a skeptic or you can be a non-skeptic if that's the way you would like to look at it. So I will play both roles. Oh my God, these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> look at this. I mean, here is this model that says that in, in summer, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma area here is going to be one of the true hot spots. And the Hadley model says that it's not going to be one of the true hot spots. I mean, this and that are completely different. This is the most fundamental of variables. If these climate modelers can't even manage to predict the distribution of temperature or even have the pattern look the same, how do we expect us to make decisions about a climate prediction like that? Okay, on the opposite end, I can't find a model out there it doesn't suggest that a place like Austin, Texas is at least going to be four or five degrees warmer and could be more. And as a matter of fact, if I look over the entire United States, every single climate model that's out there suggests that you're going to get somewhere at least three degrees warming on every piece of property in the continental United States. So how significant is three degrees? So you have both sides of this. Let's look at precipitation. That's the changes that occurred over the 20th century. There's what the Canadian model suggests will be the precipitation change. Now this is a percent change, 100% weaker, uh, wetter. This is drier. Green is slightly wetter. 
There's the Hadley model. There's the Canadian model. Okay. From my viewpoint, I look at this and say, hmm, this is interesting. What's going on here? Well, one thing that's going on in that case is the Pacific Ocean is getting a little warmer. The westerlies take the air masses on to the continent. Those air masses are a little bit juicier. And so just because the ocean warms up a little bit, I get a little bit more rainfall in California. But, you know, sorry, 100% of the rainfall in Arizona is no big deal. Okay, <laughs> now, there is another kind of pattern I see, and that is that I don't see changes, or maybe it's a little bit drier if I'm in the lee of the Rocky Mountains. And it's, it's particular meteorological phenomena that make it rain in Denver. We're in the westerly flow where the air masses go up, up the Sierra Nevadas and up the Rockies. It cools, it reaches saturation, it rains, it gives us wonderful snow, and then it comes over the top of the Rocky Mountains and the air mass begins to subside. And as it subsides, it gets warmer and its humidity, its relative humidity goes down and it's hard to make it rain in Denver. Okay? So both of these models are saying, hmm, don't, don't, don't expect a lot here. But now, what about this? Wetter in the Hadley model, drier in the Canadian model. And I'm going one more time. If I want to really trash these models, I can sit here and say, you fools, you can't even get the sign right. This isn't just warming a little bit. Fundamental variable like precipitation. And you have one model that's saying it's going to be wetter, and you have one model that's saying it's going to be drier. What am I to believe? How am I ma to manage that? Well, the interesting thing about it is, is, unlike talking about the Lee of the Rocky Mountains, the rainfall in these two places is dependent on convective rainfall, on thunderstorms, on tropical depressions. What do I have trouble modeling when I'm trying to capture the entire globe and run simulations for a century? I don't have the detailed computer time and effort in order to resolve single thunderstorms. So, I have to simplify clouds. And in the process of simplifying clouds, I get two different answers. This one, the world is warming up slightly. It's actually intensifying the hydrologic cycle a little bit. It's raining a little bit more there. This one is, rain, this one is warming up more. It begins to shut down the clouds and it begins to dry up the surface and then there's nothing to evaporate and so it's shutting down the hydrologic cycle. And this is a problem that we have just because we are challenged by the notion of fully resolving clouds in a climate simulation, in a model. Okay? So, here we are. We're sitting there with two models, one on one end of the spectrum, and one on the other end of the spectrum in terms of sensitivity, and what can I tell you? I can tell you that the, the changes that are predicted to occur because of this change in selective absorbers could be significant. But there's a big range, even in simple variables, and in some cases, we're even uncertain about the sign. So what do you do when scientists tell you you know, something really big could be happening here. This climate change issue could be really significant. And then they're dead on honest and tell you exactly what that level of uncertainty is. And then they turn around and tell you, not only is that uncertain, but I don't think that if I come back to you in a decade that I'll have nailed clouds. They're even hard to observe. To get all of the things you need to understand a cloud from the vertical velocities and the particles that are there and the amount of water vapor and its shape and its reflectivity, all these things that we have to measure all at the same time, NASA and all its wisdom and capability hasn't yet crossed that threshold. And so in a decade, I'm going to come back to you again and say clouds are still a problem. I'm not sure I can tell you the sign of the precipitation change that occurs in southeastern United States. Okay, so what do you want to do? Well, one thing you can do is turn around and say, let's look at potential impacts. 
let's look at all of those things where I live and how I act, and I want to know how different they are if the Canadian model is right or how different they are if the Hadley model is right, and then I, individually, we can all look and say, I don't like that, or I think I can deal with that. And we get a different pers perspective on climate change if we start addressing that third question, which is how significant might those impacts be? So let's just look through that for ecosystems, for water, for agriculture, for human health. And here is a model set for ecosystems. And hopefully you can read this notion of tundra, but, but let's just, you can focus anywhere, but if you don't mind, let's drive from Miami to Maine. And so you're going to drive through the Florida savanna and grassland, and then you're going to come into this south, southeast mixed forest and a temperate forest that occurs there, the northeast mixed forest that includes substantial number of hardwoods, and then the conifers. Okay, you got that? You're ready to drive 100 years from now from Miami to Maine. All right. So, Hadley model. There's... This is the low sensitivity model. Now, if you memorize that last diagram, you see that the southeastern forest is now poking its way up to Washington, D.C. And you'll see that the conifers have now left the continental United States. So there's been a migration of this biome, this set of forests, into uh, Canada. And the northeast hardwoods are substantially reduced in the area. Now, of course, you can look at the Canadian model and you realize the vegetation typical of Florida today, savanna and grassland, is all the way to Virginia. You've almost lost the hardwoods. The, uh, the uh, mixed forest, temperate mixed forest, is now much farther north. Okay? So with either model, there's either some change in the distribution of forests or substantial change in the distribution of force. But you want to know something that doesn't matter, right? Because as soon as your grandchildren are exploring, and even if the Canadians are right, and you're driving, your grandchildren are being driven around the northern part of Georgia, and the beautiful Appalachians, and they're covered with rolling grasslands, and the sheep are grazing on them, Nobody will know exactly what they've missed, right? It really does come down to this issue of humans placing value on some of these things because I think the economists might be right. And that is without that assignment of value, future generations will look at the landscape much the way they do in England and believe it's beautiful and habitable. Okay, it's an interesting issue to start to think about. Okay, now, here's another one, and that is, this is the distribution of the sugar maple. This is the distribution of the sugar maple in the Hadley model, the low sensitivity model. Basically, they're gone. And, and sh maple trees are already shifting. And if you looked at maple syrup as one of the indicators, the center of maple syrup industry was in Maryland in the early 1900s, then it went to Vermont, and now you will see things that even say Vermont maple syrup and you'll discover that it's a product of Quebec but somehow it's been processed in Vermont. And it is, it is increasingly common that it's coming from Quebec, that those same climate conditions that are good for maple syrup, but you didn't notice, right? So this is an issue of does it matter a hundred years from now if you drive to Newfoundland to see fall colors? as long as the fall colors are there? Or is it something that you look at and say, you know, that really, that's too much for me? Okay, heat index. And this is the notion that it's not just the temperature, it's how it feels. So you have to include things like the humidity. And this is a change, 25 degrees is this dark color, in how it might feel. And when I lived in Pennsylvania, I used to say, well, this is no big deal. People enjoy living in Houston. And now I, <laughs> and now I find myself in Austin. And, of course, I have a rather different perspective, perhaps, about what this might be like. 
Okay, the one reason why people are concerned about heat is because of things like mortality, because it gets too hot. And many of you, I'm sure, remember reading about what occurred a couple summers ago in France in terms of a significant number of deaths. And here is the case of the Chicago heat wave that occurred in 1995, of which this is the heat index, what we just showed you in that previous, what I showed you in the previous one, the maximum temperature there that was poking above 100 degrees there that occurred for a particular period of time, and then the mortality in Chicago. And so here's a case where people look at climate change and they say, do you realize the number of people that may die because of heat? And this is something that's not acceptable. Now, it's interesting to look at this because who died? It was almost all elderly. They were almost all poor. They lived in areas where they were concerned about crime. Even though their apartments were very hot, they kept the windows shut and locked at night. And they didn't have sufficient money for air conditioning. And so apartment temperatures went up to 130, 135 degrees. And human metabolism doesn't work very well at that temperature. And if you were already sick, of course, this was something that was also easier. Some people went and looked at it and said, you know, and, and I always apologize for using this word, that this was just harvesting. These people were about to kick the bucket anyway, and the heat just pushed them over the edge a little bit. But, of course, that's a medical term. It's not my term, okay? But, of course, they looked downstream to see if the number of deaths declined, and, and it didn't. This is simply because people shut their windows. Now, if you're in Jacksonville or Atlanta, do you die from the heat? Well, the roofs are different. They reflect light. And air conditioning is common. And so all of those things that you have to separate buildings, not have tenements that are close together, that restrict airflow, and a dark tar paper roof that absorbs energy, those are things you wouldn't think about having in the South, right? And so this isn't just economics. This is how buildings are tuned to the climate. And we can adjust that. It gets quite cold in the Northeast, but it's very rare to hear somebody dying because it's too cold. And that's because cities have heat assistance for people that are poor. And there's no reason why you couldn't have cool assistance for people that were poor. So it's one of those things where you could look at this with a certain amount of fear. It's going to get hot and people are going to die. Or you could look at it in terms of the fact that the social construct of construction and heat, heating assistance, cooling assistance, are things that say we can handle this particular problem. Of course, that's not without a cost. But it may not be something to be afraid of. But it may be something that costs society because they have to re-engineer their buildings. Okay, here's another case. If I do a survey, and if we had thought to do this beforehand, except it would be a human subject issue and we'd have to get all sorts of permissions. But if we did a survey here about all the things people have heard about with climate change and what really worries you the most, people will tell you it's diseases that might change. What if those tropical diseases, the scary diseases, move into the United States? And just things like West Nile virus have sent people with a lot of worries around this country. And West Nile virus is something that got a toehold in New York City area because of a very warm winter. So what happens here because of this? And it's quite interesting to think about this because if we take something like dengue fever and the number of cases reported in a 20-year period, and we take border counties of Texas, 64 cases, border states of Mexico, 62,500 cases. Dengue fever can be quite nasty. There are four variations for it. One of them is dengue hemorrhagic fever. You basically begin to bleed through your tissues and into your lungs. And that's not really conducive to, to uh, living. And so there is a relatively high mortality that's associated with that. It's delivered by a mosquito, Aedes aegypti, and the mosquito is sensitive to temperature. If it gets very cold, the mosquito doesn't like it. And so basically, you're not looking at it in the northern states, you are looking at it in the southern states. But what's going on here between the difference of these two? What's occurring here is that if you're in an area 
for which you don't have the same economic capability and it's hot and it becomes dusk and the inside of your building is very hot and you don't have air conditioning, you send the kids out to play. And you're sending them out to play at the time when your home is the hottest and is also the feeding time for the mosquito. And so this is described as presenting a profile, a larger profile to the mosquito. And so someone is accumulating a significant number of mosquito bites and therefore their, in, their opportunity to catch the disease is much greater. Some places put out chickens in cages called sentinel chickens to accumulate thousands of mosquito bites to see if a disease is present. It's associated with mosquito populations. So here it, all, here it is a set of an area for which we present a large profile to the mosquito. And here is a place where we present a smaller profile to the mosquito. You're more likely to have screens. You're more likely to have air conditioning. If dengue fever is present, you're more likely to have a health alert. If it's present, you're more likely to spray. If you know it's coming, you may even use a larvicide. All of those things that a public health infrastructure and a little bit of wealth causes you to present a smaller profile to the mosquito. So how much should we worry about tropical diseases coming into the United States? This is saying that any nation that is capable of providing a robust public health infrastructure dramatically minimizes the risk from a mosquito-borne disease and dramatically minimizes the, the, the case for global warming producing something to really worry about in terms of human health. But again, I don't want to answer that question for you, right? Because it's a sense of how you balance that risk and whether you have confidence that the U.S. public health infrastructure and our economy will remain so robust that that's not an issue. And even to the extent to which 64 cases of mortality in a 20-year period is something that you find acceptable or not acceptable. I can't answer that for you. It becomes one of those issues as you start to balance all those things that might change and all that uncertainty we have with the climate model predictions. Here's another case, and it's an interesting one, I think, because we start to look at what might the water manager of the future face and so in this particular case, this is light rainfall and very heavy rainfall. And one of the things that people have seen in observations for about 60 years is that the number of heavy rainfall events are increasing. It's almost as if you could have a place and, and the Weather Channel could tell you that you've had the same amount of rain that year as you had last year. But it all came in downpours, all at one time. And some of the climate model simulations are suggesting event rainfall becomes more common. And the observations are suggesting that. And that's the pink. The blue is the stream flow that occurs. And here you see the interesting confluence of the fact that the rainfall may come in an event and we're covering more and more of the surface with impervious materials. And so it makes the streams flashier. So this suggests that one impact of climate change might mean a different way in which we manage runoff from rainfall if you want to get practical about it. Now this is a changes in western snowpack. And so this again is the prediction that occurs in the Canadian model, the Hadley model. Here's different pieces of the Rocky Mountains. And if the Canadian model is right, almost the entire snowfall, snowpack, in these parts goes to near zero. And if the Hadley model is right, then there are portions of the Rockies that are really not changed very much. Some part may lose about half, and you know, the more southern part of the Rocky Mountains may lose their snowpack. This becomes an interesting issue because this is a natural storage device for water if you live in a place like Denver, right? I don't have to build a dam. I have all that snow that's accumulating. It melts all year long and provides me with water. Now with climate change, remember that powerful feedback you have, and now the fact that the snow line is climbing up the mountain as it begins to get warmer and warmer. 
And so the area at which you're saving that snow, accumulating that snow, becomes smaller and smaller. And then it becomes easier and easier to melt it into the springtime. So can Denver count on, count on that snowpack to exist there? As a matter of fact, Denver's in a fascinating place, right? Because it's hard to make it rain there. If it does rain, it might be flashier. And the natural storage device is missing. Does that mean you can't have water for Denver? No, because maybe you have just as much rainfall in the Rocky Mountains that's occurring there. Maybe you have even a little bit more, but now you have to capture it. So you build a dam. And now you see a trade-off between two things. Is it a nightmare? No, it's not a nightmare. Do you want a dam? No, maybe not. But a solution is there. You just have to pay for it. And you have to alter your concept of what you think is reasonable for a particular surface in a, surf a region in order to satisfy a human need for water. Okay, now many people prefer to sit there and think about not just what happens to snowpack, but what happens to the tendency towards drought. And so again, I'll take those same two climate model simulations, all right? Now here's the Hadley climate simulation, and this is a prediction of drought. There's all sorts of, of, of indices, and this one's called the Palmer indices. And if you, oops, if you see a green dot, oh man, I just want you to see the world there in Canadian model. If you see a green dot, there's less tendency for drought. If you see a brown dot, there's more of a tendency towards drought. The bigger the dot, the bigger the tendency. It's okay? So, this is a Hadley model simulation that suggests a huge portion of the United States, here and here, have less tendency towards drought. There's our Lee of the Rocky Mountains, just as clear as it can be. Because not only is the air coming here, going up over the mountains, raining or snowing, coming down and subsiding, becoming warmer, the relative humidity goes down. I can't get it to rain. It's also warmer. Evaporation is greater, greater drought tendency. Hard to escape. And then I tell people, I hope the Canadians don't know what they're doing. <laughs> because remember, the clouds changed and that and as it warmed too much, the surface began to dry out. And there was a 20% lower precipitation that occurred here. And it's also warmer and evaporation is greater. There's still the Lee of the Rocky Mountains. You want to know a problem is, I, I can't tell you this model's bad. I can tell you I hope it's bad. I can't tell you it's bad. I have no clear way with all the things I can do to test models to tell you which model is good and which model is bad. Tough problem. You're making decisions in the face of uncertainty and if we're honest about climate models, there's just a lot I can't tell you. Okay, here's corn yields. And there, 1988 drought cost about two or three billion dollars. It was centered in Ohio and a substantial uh, substantial uh, TV newspaper event. But what's this? That's bioengineering. That's, you know, farming techniques. That's fertilizer. That's irrigation. That's all the things humans are capable of doing to increase corn crop. So climate influences corn. Humans also influence corn production. And as a matter of fact, with either one of these climate models, despite the fact that there's drought, the agricultural specialists believe this country will have plenty of food. If you can't grow it here, you can grow it there. We've only begun to bioengineer foods, crops. There's an awful lot about them that we've looked at to add drought tolerance, but not yet salt tolerance, not yet some of the other things. And we do have the potential to move water around. And so every single model says, you just may not grow it in one place. You may grow it somewhere else. You may have it shift into parts of Canada or some other location. It just might not grow where it's growing now. And again, you come up with this issue. And does a Georgia peach have to be from Georgia? Or are you perfectly happy just to have peaches? Do you even know where your peaches come from? I gave an assignment to a class of looking at the present-day distribution of oats, 
looking at all the climate parameters, taking a future climate simulation, and having the students tell me where oats would grow in the future. And so as you can imagine, here is oats centered in the breadbasket of the United States, and with the climate model simulation, it moved forward. The last question on the assignment is, does this, is this a problem? One young man wrote, you know, I've never known where my Cheerios came from. <laughs> as long as I have Cheerios, I think in the future, I won't care where my Cheerios came from. <laughs> and so you begin to start to look at this in terms of these issues. Maybe some small farmers lose out because they don't have the resiliency. And the large farmers do because if it doesn't grow here, it grows there. If they lose this crop, this crop over here is more valuable. If they really have a successful crop, they're selling it somewhere else. And so it becomes an interesting issue. But food is not threatened in climate model simulations. Food security is not threatened in climate simulations as far as we know, unless the pests do something that we can't predict. It may cost you more water. It may cost you more fertilizer. We can produce food. Uh, are you tired of me yet? <laughs> Would you like one more example? Okay, one more example. I, I have a lot of fun with this example, and it, it's, I, I want you to know it's not a perversity in my personality. <laughs> this is a prediction of sea ice, current extent, it's summer sea ice, Canadian model, 2030, 2095, and you see that it's gone. Remember this potent feedback that we have here. And many of you may know that this year there was actually a Northwest Passage, pieces of ice that were floating there but actually a Northwest Passage for the first time that humans have ever known about it. Now, what is interesting about this is that when this picture was presented it to, me, to me, I was chairing the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate in the National Academy of Sciences, and it was being presented by the U.S. Navy. And it was being presented not from climate scientists doing their thing, it was by the physical oceanographers and climate scientists that work in the Navy and don't publish papers out here. And their models were suggesting that, and, and you perhaps didn't see this when you looked at this, their models were suggesting that the Arctic Ocean would become a theater of operation of military ships within 20 years, as long as the hulls were ice hardened, okay? Because there are pieces floating there and so you bump into them. And the debate they were having was whether or not the U.S. military should propose to the Bush administration to build ships in case of global warming. An interesting thing to think about because how long does it take for the U.S. Congress to appropriate a ship? <laughs> How long does it take to build one? All of those things, they said, 20, 25 years. So they have to decide whether to start putting in their budget ice-hardened tilt to the national. And then, does the uncertainty in global warming tilt to the national security side? Or does it not? And again, we see over and over again that the issue of climate change, because there is so much uncertainty, falls to this notion of individual perceptions on vulnerabilities, risks, and how you value things. Okay, so just to summarize, what do scientists really believe about global warming? If I give it to you, as a global average, and I give it to you in a range, I can capture every skeptic and everyone who believes that the sky is falling. That's not a debate about whether greenhouse gases produce warming. It's not a debate about whether humans produce warming. If you put selective absorbers in the atmosphere, you will change the balance of energy. It's hard to avoid. The question is, is how fast, how much? Not whether humans can alter climate, right? How much can they alter climate? If it's global and it's a range, I can get everybody in the same tent. And follows from that notions that if you accept some warming, you're likely to have higher precipitation. You're likely to have 
snow and ice retreat. You're likely to have, very likely to have, some sea level rise. But if it's a particular place, a particular time, and involves particular events, like storms, I can't help you. I just don't know the answer. It's too complicated. It's going to stay complicated. It's a tough problem. It requires a lot of people, a lot of observations, a lot of models, and incredibly fast computers. Ten years from now, I'll come here, and I'm willing to bet I'll tell you the exact same thing. So, you know, what do you do? Well, we can look at the predictions. We can take all those things that all these experts have done, and we can take the low sensitivity model and the high sensitivity model and every model in between and start to look at what it means for where we live. And what we see is, if you want to be a skeptic, you can, because they look different. Even in the most fundamental of variable, to be honest, they look different. And even in something like precipitation, we have places on this surface that we don't even have the sign down. Will it be wetter or will it be drier? Now, on the other hand, you can look at it from the other perspective and say, change. I don't like change. Or you can look at it and say, I can't find a place in the United States that's not going to warm at least three degrees. But there is the crux of why you can find so much argument in the newspapers is that level of uncertainty. How do you make decisions in the face of that uncertainty? So I think you have the third, and that is what are the potential impacts? Let me look at the things that mean something to me, whether it be ecosystems or water or food security or human health. And over and over again, you realize that humans can manage this problem if you want to manage the problem, right? You can sit there and work to have a robust health infrastructure. Do you trust that? You can produce food. It may be bioengineered and you may pay a tax in terms of fertilizer and water. Water may be one of the most difficult things at all. And you can pick places on the earth, like Denver, that I just can't see a way, the physics do not allow me to find a way to say that Denver won't be in trouble a lot of other places, you're okay. All right, so it becomes an interesting problem. Is it worth the investment? How does that investment compare to the notion of what you might do in order to mitigate, in order to at least attempt to reduce the magnitude of that change? Because this becomes the issues that you have to weigh. And I hope you appreciate the fact that I can't stand up here and tell you, look out, this is gonna happen, this is going to be bad. Human health is going to be terrible. This is what's going to happen to your water resources, and you better do something about it because the world is really going to be in trouble. It's quite a different problem. Living in the face of uncertainty, weighing all those vulnerabilities, deciding whether or not they're acceptable or not, deciding what your level of risk is, and this is something which I think as a nation we haven't actually debated. Thank you very much for your attention. I didn't, okay. Yeah, okay, first of all, is there any economists in the room? <laughs> because, you know, my, my, my so I'm going to be perfectly rude, okay? It's actually a question of, of whether the economists are telling you which path to take because, because one option of doing something about it might be cheaper than doing all these things where you have to sit there and think about how I'm going to manage water, build dams, do public health. And how do you balance all those issues? And I, and I was being rude because if an economist ever gets the future right, they get a Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> And so this is a tough problem for them to think about as well. And there are so many different facets of it. And you're seeing many, many economists come in there and say that, you know, it is much cheaper to be doing something about this in advance. 
And then there are other people that are saying, this is such a slow-moving thing that if I start to look at the value of money and I start to look at when all of a sudden I have to do something, I can wait for a while. It's interesting, there are also several reports now wandering around Wall Street which are suggesting the benefits of investing in environment-conscious companies because they can't actually see that the environment-conscious companies and the not-so-environment-conscious companies have different value. And they think one will be pre better prepared for some of the future changes. So, you know, there are so many things wrapped up in there, I can't tell you the answer. And I'm not an economist either. And I was just rude to them, which is, you know. So, yeah. Eric, before we yeah. take the next question, there are people watching the other room. Yeah. So you can repeat the questions they can hear. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay, so this is an excellent question. This question is, okay, you just told me what was going on in the United States and all of these things that might move, like plants, what about people that live on the coast? And the simple fact of the matter is, if, if large sea level changes occur, it becomes a serious issue for places like Bangladesh or Miami. You know, personally, I don't think we'll let Miami go, go under. I think we'll do something, the, the next dike or something like that. I can sort of imagine the the engineering solution about it. If it becomes really a significant sea level change, then that becomes a significant problem. And some people believe that it's actually the potential of, of, of poorer populations migrating. It becomes one of the most significant issues. And, and I'll just take this as a moment to point out that I gave a talk about an eco economically advantaged country. Economic capability, and I actually tie that to energy. Energy security and economic security are actually what are going to allow you to adjust to these problems if you have to. And if you are not advantaged, then each one of these changes becomes much, much more severe. So for Africa, I would give a completely different talk. Yes. Okay. Okay, so here's a lot of public awareness that comes out of something like, like uh, Al Gore's presentation. And if you don't mind, I, I would like to contrast both ends of the spectrum because this is the way the press does it every single time. Okay? On this end of the spectrum and then on this end of the spectrum. If I'm on this end of the spectrum and I'm telling you really not to worry about it and I'm sitting there in a sense, ignoring all of the things that could, might, or even, say, selectively choosing between curves of how the sun changes through time because it fits something and I grasp onto that and I tell you not to worry about it, that has the potential to be a real disservice. My feeling is that if I sit here and tell you to be afraid, and every time you hear something about global warming, you hear that the catastrophe is going to happen on the Earth. Big climate changes have occurred through Earth history. The Earth is fine. The Earth will deal with this. You will have trouble dealing with it. The Earth will do fine, okay? There's been all sorts of changes that have occurred before in the past, all right? My feeling is we have fear and don't worry. And if Al Gore would tone down a little bit of the fear side and stick to some of those science elements, I would be happier. Because the simple fact of the matter is we have to tell everybody what we know and what we don't know. And we have to tell everybody what the range of possible abilities that means for every single thing that we're talking about. And the uncertainties aren't just with the climate models. Critique that model of forests and the biomes. I don't know whether the trees can leap cities and farmlands. I do not know whether this collection of species can happily just march to northern latitudes. Some species are more opportunistic. They have all sorts of different relationships. There's all sorts of non-analog situations. You didn't just take this climate and move it here. 
You changed a whole set of characteristics of that climate. What are the pests going to do? What if you have events that are occurring in there? I don't know the answers to all those questions. I think we have to be just deadly honest about everything we don't know and what we do know, and in the process, try to work through this in a much more systematic fashion. And I think you could have a much better debate. And sometimes I don't even want to give a climate change talk because people want to bin you. You're here or you're here. I'm listening for it. I'm listening for all those cues that tell me that you're a tree hugger <laughs> or you like oil. <laughs> and sorry, we all like oil. And what's more is we're going to be dependent on that in a resource for a very, very long time. And many of these issues about climate change occur simply because we have a lot of people. And you're not going to change that. You, there's no way you can have this many people without changing what the planet is like. We're talking about carefully managing the future and making decisions pro and con about particular issues. We're really not talking about being here or here. And I, this sounds a little bit like a soapbox, but I kind of figured it out one time because when I was at Penn State, they had a journalism program, and the journalism program constantly came and talked to me. Ozone. Oh, let's go ask Dr. Barron what he thinks about ozone. Oh, it's a hot summer. It must be global warming. Let's go ask Dr. Barron what he thinks about global warming. Oh, cold winter. It must not be global warming. Let's go ask <laughs> Dr. Barron what he thinks about this. And I would sit there, and I would talk to the person, and I'd say, okay, you got everything you needed? Yes. One more question they would say. And I would say, oh, what's that? Who can I talk to to get the exact opposite opinion? <laughs> now you realize that in the face of not knowing about the earth, not understanding how things work, we believe that the way to deliver information fairly is to get both ends of the spectrum. And we can't afford it anymore. We just can't afford it on a topic like this. We ought to be able to reveal all those ugly things about climate model simulations. We also ought to be able to reveal and talk about all those things from ecosystems to water that will make some people worried and some people say, I, I think I can solve that problem. No. Yes? Yeah, I noticed that a lot of the uh, remedies and uh, coping mechanisms that you talked about, uh, like moving crops from this place to another place and moving water around to irrigate places that are more, becoming more drought prone, all those things require a tremendous amount of energy. And, and I, I work with energy, and um, I also have been studying quite a bit about the concept of peak oil. And I've also noticed that in Canada, they're using natural gas to make <coughs> synthetic petroleum out of tar sands, which is a problem for you know greenhouse gas releases. And I just wonder if any of your models take into consideration the fact that, well, with petroleum and natural gas supplies dwindling and uh, the producers going more to these synthetic fuels like uh, liquid from coal that emits just tremendous amounts more uh, greenhouse gases, do any of your models or any of your discussions take into consideration this uh, peak energy uh, situation that seems uh, oh. Okay, so, so the basic question here is, this changes energy demand. The supply of energy, the mix is likely to change. Some of those things that are in the mix could provide more, put more CO2, not less CO2. And do models take this into account? So one thing we have is the uncertainties with climate models. The second thing we have, the second major uncertainty we have, is the path of human invention associated with CO2. And so just like 30 climate models might be used, 30 different climate models might be used to create this spaghetti diagram of the future, there are 15 and 20 scenarios of exactly that type of topic. No one can see, no matter what we come up with, a decline, a leveling out of CO2 emissions until about 2040 or 2050. It's just the nature of, of both appetite, cost, you know, China's CO2 emissions are now passing the United States. They have abundant coal. It's cheap. Are they going to use it? Are other developing countries going to use it? Or are they going to wait for, you know, a high technology, high cost solution? High technology, high cost solutions are again what we have in wealthy countries that have the capabilities to do these things. 
So there is this whole range of scenarios, and some of them make this problem much worse, and some of them, after 2050, limit the total long-range impact. It doesn't stop you from achieving some warming. Some warming is already in the mix here, but it limits the total magnitude that you have. But then now, what's going to happen? Are we capable of clean coal technology in the real, in the real sense? Um, this university has two major programs in carbon sequestration. If things like that are successful and we figure out how to use it, we may offer significant solutions to these problems. All those things are sitting out there which are in the realm of possibility if as a nation and other nations we decide to invest in these, in these efforts both to make sure that our emissions are lower or to look at some of the alternatives and add them into the mix. But the fossil fuels are going to be here for quite a long time. It, it's, it's hard to imagine any scenario that they wouldn't be. And, you know, if you look at it, what, what causes someone to trade in their truck? I, I had a Toyota Tunda. I loved this. my favorite vehicle in the whole wide world. And I'm sitting here, you know, how do I talk about climate change and drive a Toyota Tundra? Okay, it's a, this is a tough thing, but, but I tell people I was born to burn carbon. You know, I, I was, you know. I came from an age where how many cc's in your engine was, you know, it. This, this is a, this is a, it's a very challenging thing to cross that line, but price drives people to turn in their vehicles. And so, wh wh what will that take? I, you know, it's, this is, it's too hard to change, and there's just this whole family of curves right there, right along with a whole family of curves of climate models. Yes? Right, okay, so now the question here is why not the sun? And you will see every year articles in the newspaper that say this is all because of the sun. And there are many books out there right now that says, and, and part of it is this mentality, it would be so much easier to deal with this problem if it were natural. I kind of think humans are part of nat nature too, but, but there is this sort of notion about, about the sun. Okay, so here's the, the things that you think about. One, we need to change the energy balance. The same way that a selective absorber changes the amount of watts per meter squared in a particular area, in order to change the climate system, I need some other mechanism, some other change of energy that also drives that system. In all of the models on solar variability, looking at other stars, looking at observations of our sun, and looking at models, we see that in this sort of time frame, the sun might be capable of changing a tenth of a watt per meter squared. It's about 20% of what we see in the same types of exercises that CO2 will do. So that places the sun in a smaller role. Now there's one trick to this, because what some people are proposing is that it's actually the higher energy flux components of the sun that and the solar wind that in penetrating the atmosphere change the amount of clouds that we have. So if that flux were changing and increasing and I made clouds in the top part of the atmosphere, then, then I would change the energy balance because I would change the amount of energy reflected by that cloud versus how much was radiated to space. And because that cloud is sitting up very high and radiating at a very cool temperature, what's radiating to space doesn't affect the surface, and so that cloud warms the Earth. So some people say it's this solar mechanism here that produces clouds in the right place to explain the warming. Now, okay, my view is, I haven't observed it, it isn't something that people have come up with models to show that this mechanism will work. It's an idea. And which one do I want to pick? The one that I know is a selective absorber that changes the energy balance in every laboratory experiment. I can do the, what's called a radiative transfer in the atmosphere and actually calculate those changes in energy and then see its change. 
And I see that CO2 is changing with the first order temperature change. Do I want to take that one or do I want to pin my hopes on the fact that there might be a link between parts of the solar spectrum and cloud cover that I haven't observed but could explain it in terms of a natural component. Now, one of the other problems with that is that the observations that we have of those fluxes from the sun are only a length of a couple of decades. And all the rest of it is called a proxy. We don't have a direct measurement. You look at sunspot numbers. You look at you know, brightness indices. You look at all of these things like that, and we're not even sure how well connected they are. So, you know, hope. It's not human. This linkage might occur. It isn't observed yet. Or something more robust. So these climate scientists aren't willing to accept the notion of something that I have to pick a mechanism that's not yet physically demonstrated. They also worry about one other thing. If that small bit of solar flux could have that dramatic a change on the climate system, it implies that the climate system is enormously sensitive. It makes the climate model from the Canadians look wimpy. Right? Because you're suggesting a very small flux in a portion of the solar spectrum is capable of altering the climate by a significant amount. So the climate scientists aren't willing to sign up for that particular topic for those two reasons. Have you noticed he asked me a question and I give a 10 minute answer? <laughs> That's incredible. Yes. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't think the Earth will have any trouble returning. It's, it's, uh, there are all of these things that create balance. And once you stop putting the forcing mechanism into the atmosphere, it may take a while to draw it down, but then the energy balance has to readjust all over again. And so a lot of people look at a tipping point as where something truly dangerous begins to happen or some real flip occurs in the system. And, you know, there are some arguments for, for transients, for abrupt changes that may, may occur. But it's hard to picture something where, where now it's all over. And actually, this is a question senators ask. When I presented some of this in testimony in the Senate, the, Senate, the senator says to me, well, at what point is it dangerous? How do you answer that question? Is that the small farmer talking? Is that the coastal villager talking? Is that someone who lives in a border part that's worried about a tropical disease talking? I, I don't even know how to answer this question. But, but I don't think there's some boundary. The earth has gone through a lot of changes. Yes? No, no, that, that one is 2000 and now there, but just like anything else, I could pick 10 models and that would be one of them and some other model would do it earlier and some other model would do it later.
okay, so here, here's the basic no, notion of this. If you take that sea ice prediction from a few years ago and then you look at obser observations, it looks like it's melted faster. So now do I say I better take the bad end of this, the worst end of this, and, and accept that as, as, as part of the, the issue and therefore take action because of it. Now, to me, I would say to you, you have just added value to a whole group of things and made a conscious decision whether or not you went through the steps to say, I don't really like this. It could be worse. I think I should do something about it. I believe each person has to make this, so I try not to say it. And I could play devil's advocate if you want, okay? Unobserved, because humans haven't had that much time looking at sea ice distributions. We have ships. We have occasional observations. We have 30 years of satellites. Here's global warming. Here's superimposed on it. Natural variability and waxing and waning of the sea ice. So the last six years have superimposed this with this and therefore melted much more than a model that's just marching forward. On the other hand, it could be that the climate model is not sensitive enough. The ice is going to melt even faster than we... And this is the proof. Do we take six years of observations and say that's it in a system that's that variable? Again, there's this level of uncertainty that we have to deal with and you will make a decision about those things that really make a difference. I, I, I think we're at the stage where we have to start looking at them systematically and weighing it. Just like being in the Defense Department and saying national security risk, how important that is to me, here's the uncertainty in the climate models, do I want to build a ship? And you start to make conscious, deliberate decisions rather than saying, oh my God, the world's changing. But it, it's a tough thing. Yes. Yeah. Are there any other feedback mechanisms going on that you worry about? Uh, okay, well, frankly, I'm not really sure what the biosphere is going to do. And I don't see that we have such an understanding of the biosphere and how it's going to respond to CO2. And how that landscape changes will also influence climate. You know, we just have not, we have, okay, and I'm not picking on anybody. We've been doing crash courses in microbiology and genetic engineering. We've kind of left behind some of the organisms here in this part of the process. We need to have a much more comprehensive focus on that issue. That's something that I worry about, about significantly. There's a water vapor feedback that occurs there that as you warm the planet, more moisture can it, will be in the atmosphere and that acts as a greenhouse gas. You also have, once you run out of ice, the feedback doesn't work anymore. There is a limit, so how that... Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Yes. What about what? Alaska and Hawaii? Hawaii, yeah. Well, f fortunately, Hawaii has a shape like this. And so the sea level might go up the coast a little bit. But if you're on a coral atoll in which the coral has grown right up to sea level and you have this nice little atoll on a mountain that's sitting there with a coral that's just kept up, places like that are highly vulnerable to any rapid change in sea level. So some of the most uh, concerned places on the earth are countries that are tropical islands. Not Hawaii, but countries that are tropical islands. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a actually they're quite comparable. It's the reason why I can stand up here. So the, the question was, take, take this panel that I did and chaired in the Clinton administration and the same panel that I was participating in in the Bush administration. Were they, the scientists saying completely different things? And so one of the reasons why I have confidence standing up here and telling you about these uncertainties is because they're tough problems. And in the intervening years, they didn't go away. 
The exact same uncertainties are listed in both. The exact same things that we're certain about are listed in both. The range of temperatures given by the two is almost identical. It's different by tenths of a degree. And so you, you realize that we're, we're, we're enhancing our ability to make these predictions. We're trying to tie what the biosphere is doing. We're trying to do a better job of clouds. We're trying to do a better job of precipitation. They're tough problems. So the two reports are remarkably similar. Yes? Yeah, with all this uh, uh, Arctic ice uh, melting, with all the fresh water coming into the North Atlantic, I've, I've been hearing that that's going to affect the Gulf Stream and that could rapidly change the... Uh, okay, so will a rapid flux of fresh water into the North Atlantic have a dramatic impact? Now, this is a theory that's out there, and part of the reason why the theory is out there is because we see some rapid changes in the North Atlantic in Earth history. So here's the theory. Here's Greenland, rapid melting, fresh water influx into the North Atlantic. Fresh water caps the ocean, doesn't have salt, it's not as dense, and the North Atlantic is an area of sinking water. Okay, so now in an area of sinking water, I put a fresh water layer there. It's easier to freeze fresh water than it is to freeze salt water. So if this occurs, do I all of a sudden cover a big portion of the North Atlantic with sea ice and actually have global warming for a period of time make Europe colder? This is the model. And if I change that deep water flow that occurs there, because the deep water and the surface water flow are connected, there's a mass balance there, I begin to change other parts of the system. And then it takes a while for it to recover. This is called a transient effect. There are other transient effects that, are, that occur there. So we see that in Earth history. Could it happen? It could happen. It might not happen. How fast will that melting be? Will Greenland grow for a little while and then melt for a little while? And you know, that's a, another complicated system that we're just beginning to investigate. There are other, uh, there are other transient effects. I mean, I, I put, put a bet on the table in one of these meetings that that there'd be more snow in Buffalo because of global warming for a while. And the people from Buffalo didn't really appreciate this notion because <laughs> they feel they have a, not, a, a lot. But when do you get big snowfalls in, in, in Buffalo is when Lake Erie is not frozen. And you have the clipper come across and it picks up that moisture and it's cold air and it just dumps it on Buffalo. So are there already signs that whatever the mechanism that Lake Erie is not freezing as early as it did? But it'll be, a, it'll be many decades before the, the Arctic clippers stop. So this could be a transient effect, a good time to have snow in Buffalo. And, you know, it's another one of those fun things where people say, oh, how can anybody talk about global warming? Look at all that snow Buffalo's getting. But it actually might be they'll get more for a period of time. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we could actually put that diagram up there that showed the CO2 level. Okay, so the question is, is what are the changes in CO2 actually? And then what would happen in your model simulations if you weren't having the CO2 in there, if I have this, this correct? So that, that diagram there showed this, this path pre, pre-industrial, which is 280, 285 parts per million, and then, and then up there past 360, See, it's taxing my memory, 360, so 280 to 360. Now, the interesting thing about it is that one, there's several tests to climate models. One test of a climate model is can you simulate the annual cycle, the seasons, okay? That's a climate change if you think about it. The sun is changing and so, okay? And the second thing is can you simulate the last century? And if you can't simulate the last century, you assume you don't have a, a good model. Almost all of the simulations of the last century only changed CO2, and every model got it wrong. Because just doing CO2, the climate model did this, but the climate system goes this and was cooling in the, in the 50s, and then it goes back up like this, right? So 
the climate models were suggesting that warming should have been much greater and much smoother. Now, because a lot of people said, well, that's a clear failure of these models, every model includes the solar cycle, the aerosol production, particles, and CO2. And now all these models that are talking about have the curve right. It only have the curve right if they know particles, greenhouse gases, and sun. Okay? Now, the problem is that as you go farther and farther into the future, with bigger and bigger changes of CO2, all these models that simulate that 100 years well, they start to slowly diverge, and you get the 4.5 and the 1.5 models. Yes? Yeah, and, and of course, if you, th okay, so the question really is, we know we have ice ages and it's due to changes in the Earth's orbit. And if you're coming out of an ice age and you're moving into an interglacial time period, you're working towards warming anyway, right? So now the, the way to think about this is that how does a climate model work? It works by specifying all the factors that are forcing the climate. It has no memory of the ice age that occurs there. It just says, okay, here's the sun. Here's the particles that are either reflecting energy or absorbing it. Here are the gases in the atmosphere that are absorbing it. Here's what the surface looks like. Now, how does that energy all balance and what do I get at the end of it? And so those simulations will start you know, in 1885 with all of the different factors that force the climate and it'll move through time. It doesn't really have a memory of what that past is. And so if I had enough computer time, I could try to go through all the interglacial cycles if I knew what the sun was doing, the aerosols were doing, the CO2, methane were doing. I might simulate and see that whole sequence through time. There's not enough computer time to do that. But it's not something that's missing in the models. Yes? Yeah. Right. Yes, I will, and it's a uh, it's a perfectly wonderful question, and I appreciate the fact that you asked it. So here it is, we're in an ice age cycle. And if I look at the ice age cycle, and I see that the Earth's orbit is changing through time, and then I see that CO2 changes, but it changes after the orbit and after the temperature changes. So does this mean CO2 responds to climate change, not CO2 driving climate change? CO2 is a spectacularly important gas because it can be both a feedback and a driver, okay? So here's the case of a driver. I eject it into, inject it into the atmosphere, right? It could be a volcano. It could be human activity of burning fossil fuels. I put the selective absorber up in the atmosphere. I change the energy balance. CO2 is a forcing agent then that causes climate to change. Now I can take the other situation. I'm going through ice ages, one after another, and the climate's changing and it's been driven by changes in the Earth's orbit. What does it change? It changes the distribution of ice, changes the weathering of the continents, it changes the vegetation, it changes the amount of vegetation, it changes the productivity of the vegetation, it does it on land, it does it on ocean. All those things are intimately coupled with the amount of CO2 you have. So, climate change can cause CO2 to change if something that forced climate to change then changes the biosphere or changes the amount of weathering of CO2 that can occur out of the system. So, it's an excellent question because it can be both. Yes. Eric? Yes. A lot of excellent questions. How about one more question? 
I think I called uh, you. Yeah. Okay, so so there's a lot of data and a lot of different time periods that people look at. So, for instance, gauges that we have all around a lot of coastal regions, that's used to look at sea level variation. There are even things that people look at in terms of islands through time and coral reefs that keep up with sea level. The biggest challenge is to make sure that it's global, okay? And not just because even changes in the circulation can make some areas of the ocean higher and lower. There are places on the surface of the earth that because ice has melted, it's slowly coming up. There are places where if you're removing a lot of water or you have all sorts of buildings, you're changing what the substance is. It's, so it's a very complicated measurement that people work hard to try to work through gauges and the stability of the coastline and all those other factors to try to come up with the sea level curve. And if you're talking about measuring centimeters, that's, that's a tough problem. But there's lots and growing numbers of observations and satellites are now playing a critical role in looking at this issue and removing some of the uncertainties. Well, let's thank uh, 